So I'm reading today two portions from St. Paul's letters to the Corinthians, one from 1 Corinthians and the second from the second letter to Corinthians. I'm hoping, yes, it's up there on the screen. Now concerning the collection for the saints, you should follow the directions I gave to the churches of Galatia. On the first day of every week, each of you is to put aside and save whatever extra you earn, so that collections need not be taken when I come. And when I arrive, I will send any whom you approve with letters to take your gift to Jerusalem. If it seems advisable that I should go also, they will accompany me. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver, and God is able to bless you abundantly, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor, their righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of the Lord's people, but is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Because of the service by which you have proved yourselves, others will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. And in their prayers for you, their hearts will go out to you because of the surpassing grace God has given you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Hear the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I think you're probably all very nice people when you go to Woolworths or to Coles and there's those people jiggling for money out the front of the uh, store. I can get a little bit grumpy about it because I'm going to get my shopping and the last thing that I think about is someone uh, collecting out the front uh, for some different charity. I remember uh, probably one of the, the, the most confused ones that I, w I had was going to um, one of the Woolworths around here and there was someone raising for uh, the um, surf life saving. And I was thinking, we're a long way from a beach. And I thought, it's, it's kind of a bit of a, a weird place to be collecting for surf life saving. But another experience was uh, something that I did have a connection to, and that was the St. Hilary's food drive, where they were collecting uh, tin food and a whole lot of uh, uh, items from Woolworths and Coles. And then it was going to uh, Camcare and a few places around here that give out uh, resources locally. And, and the reason that I had a joy or a delight in taking the list that they had and going in and collecting almost one of everything on their list was because I had a personal connection with St. Hilary's Hope because it's, it's an initiative of 12 or so churches in our area uh, raising uh, valuable items for people who are struggling with food security in our area. See, when we have a connection with something, it makes it easier in a way to give to something. I, I struggle to find the connection between Woolworths, Camberwell and Surf Life Saving. And so it made it harder to give. 
And I think that the, the encouragement that Paul is giving in these two letters is actually he's, he's leveraging a connection that people have in Christ in order to motivate them to give. The reality is the people in Galatia don't know the church in Jerusalem. The people in Corinth don't know the church in Jerusalem. They don't know them personally. They may know that Paul has come from the church in Jerusalem, has been in Galatia, has been in Corinth and a number of other churches and their connection might be with Paul but still Paul is not leveraging that. He's actually trying to leverage the relationship with Christ as the reason for giving. So here in this letter, Paul has asked them to uh, give financially to the church in Jerusalem, which is struggling. And in the first letter to the Corinthians, Paul has asked them to set aside some money regularly for the collection in order that by the time it needs to go to Jerusalem, what they've promised to give is ready to go. The in between 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians letter, as I've said before, uh, there's a, a, a falling out or a problem that happens between Paul and the church in Corinth. And so in the second letter to the Corinthians, Paul's reminding them about the fact that they promised to give to this collection. The church in Jerusalem needs the collection and Paul is saying, even though we maybe had our differences, you still need to live up to your promise of giving to the collection as you promised to do. And so Paul is not trying to leverage his relationship with them in order to get them to give. He's actually not even trying to use guilt and shame. He's actually trying to get them to understand that their relationship with Christ, the Galatian church relationship with Christ and the church in Jerusalem's relationship with Christ makes them all part of the church of Christ and therefore uh, God has given resource to the church and it just needs to be redistributed amongst the churches. And so Paul is starting off with this concept that actually God is the one who was first to give. Paul is saying to the church in Corinth, you need to give because God first gave to you. You might remember last week as I was talking about the widow's offering, that the widow gives everything that she had to live off. And I said that Paul, uh, that Jesus is actually uh, not trying to uh, say that she's uh, given as great a sacrifice as he will give, but he's saying that it's honourable to give everything and to sacrifice everything, just as he will sacrifice his whole life for the sins of the world. But we also need to understand that it's actually God the Father who sends the Son out into the world. So it's God the Father who gives the Son first. But also God has provided for the people of God throughout all of the centuries. Throughout all of the Old Testament, God has provided for God's people. And whether that's uh, safety from invading armies, whether that's protection, whether that's uh, food in a time of famine, whatever, God has provided for the needs of God's people. And Paul, in this 2 Corinthians part, picks up this theme from the Old Testament and reminds the audience that he's writing to, saying, now he, God, who supplies the seed to the sower and bread to the food, will supply and increase your store of seed and enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. Paul is reminding them that God gives generously and God will actually be increasing in that generosity. When people are faithful, then God will actually uh, bless them abundantly. The image that Paul is using here in, the, in, in his New Testament letter actually kind of reminds us of the rich fool that we spoke about in week two. Remember in the rich fool's uh, parable that Jesus tells that the rich fool has an abundant harvest and he takes all of it and he also takes all of the credit for it. 
And Paul is saying here a reminder of that principle that it's actually God who even provides the seed, let alone uh, the soil and the sun and the rain and all the other things that help anyone to have a rich crop. So God provides generously for His people and it means that we are to have wisdom in understanding that all things come from God. But the last line of the reading that we read out today, in verse 15 it says, thanks be to God for His indescribable gift. In Paul's language, the greatest gift that God has given us is not an abundance of crop, not even the soil, uh, the seed to sow that crop, but actually Jesus, His Son, is the greatest gift that He's ever given to the world. The grace and mercy extended to us through Jesus is the greatest gift that God could ever give to us, an indescribable gift. And it's this relationship with this gift of Jesus that makes us all brothers and sisters in the church. It makes us companions in the gospel. It makes us co-workers in the, labor, the vineyard of the Lord. And in many ways, this last line of, of our reading today pulls together all these themes that we've been speaking over the last few weeks. The last four weeks, I've been encouraging us to give God the first place of honour in our life. And when we honour God with the first place, it's because He has given us everything. But also when we put God in the first place of, in our life, then actually it means that everything else falls into its appropriate place. We don't get life out of balance because we've put God in the appropriate place. The second point that I want to make this morning is that the response to God's generous gift is to also be a responsive person who gives cheerfully. Paul says that the natural response to this grace or gift from God is to see giving as a gift, as a grace. It should be a great joy and delight for us to give generously because we've received generously from God. Now, it is true that this is a passage about a collection of money. And I know potentially some of you have actually had some preachers who really want to talk about giving money and have taken another scripture that's got nothing to do with money and then made that about a collection of money. This passage is actually about a collection of money. But I actually want to elevate it to the sense that God is actually asking us to give generously and not just in terms of financial resources but give generously in our time to the mission of God. Give generously in our treasure in the way that we give financially but also it could even be that rare commodity in our society of time that we just give time to people because everybody is really busy and if you can spend time with people, it, it can be a great joy and delight for you. But some people see it as a great uh, gift to them. But Paul also wants to, the, the church in Corinth to see giving as an act of worship. Paul wants the church in Corinth to take this collection up during an act of worship. Paul wants to see this collection being part of how they gather to worship God. And I think he wants that to happen because he's, he's connecting it with God's generous gift of Jesus through his life, death and resurrection. And so if we're gathering as the church to celebrate the life, death and resurrection, then part of our response should be our generosity as well. Now, it is fair to say that whilst this collection is to be taken publicly and as an act of worship, the decision about how much an individual would give to this is actually a private matter. 
Paul says that each should decide, and I think we had in uh, verse 16, uh, in, in, uh, in 1 Corinthians 16, that you should decide what you're going to give. That's your decision to make. It's not my decision to tell you. There is no membership fee to join the church. There is no minimum amount that you have to give. But you have to decide how much you're to give. And, and in some ways, it's really up to you and God how you do that. But Paul is encouraging that the giving to the church is a public act of worship not done in secret. It's not actually to embarrass anybody. Paul's not trying to use it as a guilt Remember the warning from those who gave an extra, they sort of broke their offering down to the least, no, the, the most number of coins that they could get so it sounded more generous as they threw it into the offering. Paul is not trying to embarrass people, he's not trying to shame people, but he's actually trying to see it as an act of worship and a great joy and delight to give generously. I wonder how often we see the collection as a time of worship. I wonder how often we think of the offering and the time of praying for the offering as something we need to do to run the church, but it's sort of secondary. And, we, and the only reason we put it into the service is because it's kind of when we're all gathered and so it's a good way to do notices. But if we were to take Paul seriously, it's, it's as important as any other part of the service. I remember when I first kind of, this clicked in for me. It was a, a youth minister actually and um, he'd been taught uh, about giving and generosity. And I remember he once said to me, he said, never miss an opportunity to give. Never miss an opportunity to give. And he said, the thing is, whenever you visit another church, people think giving is is something that the local members do. And, and Ronan said to me, he said, if you visit a church, do, when they start singing, do you just go, oh, that's for the members? And when, when the gospel's read out, you sort of block your ears because that's for the members. And, and, and taking communion, well, no, that's for the members. Now, if you visit a church, Ronan said, he said, never miss an opportunity to give. Participate in the act of worship. And that's, that's stuck with me. Now, I know it's, it's, it's a foreign concept and it's hard and it's awkward. And, and, I, and I think actually probably one of the reasons that we struggle with it is actually because even though I could teach you this and, and, and we might get it, if you're not a Christian, it sounds really weird. And, and I get that juxtaposition and that, that hard jarring thing. And maybe that's why some churches actually kind of don't talk about money all that often because of how we're going to uh, make visitors feel welcome. So I know we don't get it right all the time and I, and I know I sometimes struggle and you might struggle with it. But let's not at least overlook the theological principle that giving should be part of our act of worship. And the third point I want to make this morning is that Paul is actually also trying to help the Corinthians understand that every church has a benefactor and that church has a benefactor which is their father in heaven. Because the church in Corinth is giving to the church in Jerusalem, the church in Corinth isn't the benefactor of the church in Jerusalem. The church in Jerusalem won't owe them back in return, it's not a loan, they're not having to pay it back. It's a gift because God has gifted the church in Corinth and is going to take that resource and give it to the church in Jerusalem and build a fellowship, a relationship between these two churches through the act of giving a collection. Paul is reminding every local church that they are partners in the gospel that they're not a benefactor of another church, but actually they're giving freely and generously 
for the work of the gospel that they also have in their location. And that's the beauty of the church, capital C. All these local churches are interconnected through the partnership of the gospel. All these little churches, local churches, are part of the body of Christ because of the mission of Jesus. And it's important to see that the source of all the resource for the church is God, our benefactor. It might be given to one location, but it's used in another location. It might be given to one group, but it's used by another group. And this is part of our generosity. We don't give in order that we uh, make sure that the church uses it for the projects that we're interested in. We give generously and then let people decide how they're going to use it for the mission that God has given them. We give to the church and then the church decides what to do with it. We never give on the condition that we get to decide how the money will be spent. For example, our church gives uh, some money from our offerings to mission projects. And whilst we do sit down and discern how we're to use that money, because it is a limited amount of money, and so we want to target it to something that's, that we feel God is calling us to support, once we decide how we're going to target it, we give it to that organisation without the string of how they're going to uh, use it. For example, one of our mission partners is Ridley College. Now, we don't give money to Ridley College and then tell them what books they're to buy with that money. Nor do we give that money to Ridley College and then say, and these are the candidates that we want you to accept for the pathway to ordination. No, we give generously to Ridley College and then Ridley College works out how they're going to use it to accomplish their mission of training the next generation of ministry leaders and ministry workers. We give to Josh and Elliot Mission Aviation Fellowship and we don't decide how they're going to use that mission when uh, that mission money. They are under the direction of Mission Aviation Fellowship. We give to Mission Aviation Fellowship for the support of Josh and Ellie, but then Mission Aviation Fellowship works out how that's going to be distributed. We also have a number of other things that we give to and we support them in a way but we still let those organisations determine how they're going to use the money. God is our common benefactor and all of our mission partners are responsible to God, not to us, for how they use their financial resources. Our local church, St Columns here, is responsible to God, not to our financial partners about how we use the offerings that are given to this church. So God should always take the first place of honour in our lives. I'm not really here to tell you what the other priorities should be. You might think about how you prioritise your life and that's really between you and God. But as St Paul is writing to the church in Corinth, in fact, as, as St Paul is writing to all the churches, He's really trying to say that God is number one. And if the church is not number two, it's pretty high up in the list of priorities. Giving to the mission of the church, to the body of Christ, to your brothers and sisters in Christ should be a major priority for anyone who calls himself a Christian. You know, there's an idea that pervades our world today particularly amongst the Western church, somehow this idea has developed that you can follow Jesus, call yourself a Christian, read your Bible regularly, but you never serve at church, you never give to the church and you see attendance at church as an optional extra. This is a foreign concept to the New Testament. In fact, it's a cultural Christian concept from the 1990s. It's got nothing to do with the Bible. If you were to read all of Paul's New Testament letters, giving to the church 
is an essential part of being a follower of, church, uh, of Jesus because it is part of our act of worship. Being part of the Christian community is a non-negotiable if you're following Jesus. If you're, not, if you're not part of the church, then you're not following Jesus. And so we need to place God as the first place of honour in our life. The church, the bride of Christ, shouldn't be too far behind that. I think each one of us should make it a priority to give financially to the mission of the church. You know, the reality is there is no plan B. I know there's a bit of rhetoric and talk about how, you know, Christians in our society are, are neglected or persecuted or maligned, but I don't think any of us are under the delusion that if the members of the church don't give to the mission of the church, none of us expect that there's going to be money from anywhere else. There is no plan B. So for the church to survive into the next century, there needs to be a new generation of generosity. There are two things that happen when people give financially to the church. I think we've got a slide for this, Vicky. Paul in 2 Corinthians 9, 12 says, when, when, when the church in Corinth will give to the church in Jerusalem, the first thing that will happen is that the needs of the people in Jerusalem will be met. So there are some parts of our giving where there's a, a sense that we have very practical things that need to happen. We need to pay the bills, we need to uh, maintain our property, we need to uh, do all the things about running a church and some of that we might think is not closely aligned to the mission of Jesus to make disciples. But it's a reality of living in community and being part of the church. And so as each of us give generously to the work of the church, it does pay for things like re-stumping the, the chancel, which we had an investigation on that this week. It does pay for the maintenance of our gardens and, and the paying of our electricity bills and all of those things that we have to do. It does pay for that. But Paul said the second thing that happens when people give generously to the church is that it actually intrigues outsiders. And outsiders think, I wonder why they give sacrificially to the thing that they believe in. And Paul says they will joyfully express their thanks to God. Last night I went to um, a, an event in the city and um, it was about praying and sowing a seed for revival in the church in Australia. And basically the event was funded by Red Church in uh, Nutterwadding. And, and they are giving sacrificially to sow into... Uh, seeing 24-7 prayer grow in Australia, to see revival prayed for in Australia. And as I was uh, sitting at the event last night, I was sort of thinking, I wonder, what, I wonder what part of God's mission we're called to sacrificially give to, to see something, because there is no plan B. And, and in a way, I think it's actually... <laughs> I know it sounds really obvious, but it's actually mission and ministry right here in Hawthorne. Because if, if we don't share the gospel with people here in Hawthorne, th there aren't people from Africa coming here, there aren't people coming from Asia here to, to, to spread the gospel. We need to share the gospel with people here. And I think we need to do that in a way that yes, we might meet some needs of people, but it's done in a generous spirit so that people will just be curious about why people are giving sacrificially, why people are doing that. Because I think if the first part of that happens without the second part, 
then I think Paul would also be disappointed. Remember, he's, he writes there, thanks be to God for this indescribable gift. Our generosity should be tied to helping people to understand who Jesus is and the gospel. And we should be praying for opportunities to share the gospel with people and that they would also see our generous way in which we're living our life and that would beg a question, why do they live the way that they live? Well, gracious God, we praise and thank you for your generosity. We thank you for your son, Jesus, who was um, the first step towards us being in right relationship with you. Lord, we pray that we would be uh, seeing this gift as something that we extend to other people. Lord, we realise that there's a whole lot of needs and that those needs need to be met. But Lord, we also pray that more people would come to see this indescribable gift through our ministry, through our generosity and through the way in which we share the good news of Jesus with others. And we make this prayer in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.